Good afternoon and welcome to the Mass Edge Employer Internship Panel. I'm Julie Moy, Internship Coordinator at the UTA Career Development Center. I'm joined this afternoon by our Assistant Director of Internships, David Powers. Thank you for spending time with us this afternoon. We're excited about the group of employers we have here with us today, and I know you'll gain a lot from the conversation. Students, you may begin sending questions anytime using the Ask a Question button. David will help us address some of your questions near the end of the event. Um, connecting and networking is one of the most important parts of these types of events, and sometimes that's difficult to do virtually. So please note the comments section for links, upcoming events, and panelist contact information. Um, we are recording this event, so you can look for it on LinkedIn, our YouTube channel, and our weekly internship newsletter. If you have not signed up for our weekly new <laughs> newsletter, please visit the link tree URL in the comments section. So now let's meet our guest. Um, Alonia, would you like to get us started with introductions, please? It would be great to start by unmuting, right? <laughs> you got to get in the habit of that. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me, Julie. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Aliona Dodson, and I am a senior campus recruiting and university relations specialist at Zions Bank Corporation. My role is I oversee our recruiting efforts for full-time and internship positions with our banker development program, specifically at Amogee Bank and that is our Texas affiliate. Uh, just a little bit about me. I am a Houston local. I work out of Houston, um, but I also work with all of our main markets for Amogee, which is Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth, Metroplex, and Central Texas, which is San Antonio and surrounding areas. I myself graduated from the University of Texas at Austin with a bachelor's in psychology some time ago. <laughs> I have been uh, with uh, Zions Bank Corps in Amogee for four and a half years now and have really enjoyed uh, connecting countless students and early career professionals with phenomenal career opportunities we have to offer. I love working in the college recruiting space and uh, making that positive impact on future generations of leaders. I am super excited to be a part of this panel today and to connect with talented UTA students. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Alonia. I can't wait to hear more. Uh, Miranda, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'd love to jump in. So my name is Miranda Hanel. I work here at Charles Schwab. I have been here, I'll be five years this summer, so which means I'm sabbatical eligible. So here at Schwab, we do something every five years where you get an extra 30 days paid off every five years. So I'll be going to Europe this summer for my sabbatical. So really excited. I have yes. had a couple <laughs> different roles in my career here at Schwab. I've been in HR the whole time. My role now is I manage the DFW market for early talent recruiting. So I have about 40 people on my team who will help me in recruiting efforts, but I help manage the relationships with our universities as well as manage the relationships with our students. And I help pipeline those students from university to the workforce. We do a lot of professional development, but also educating on our positions as well. I also own about 100 roles for our internship positions. We have over 400 roles every summer for interns here at Charles Schwab. So lots of different opportunities as well well. So that's a little bit about me and I'll hand it off to the next person. All right. Thank you so much, Miranda. Michelle. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Michelle Barclare. I am a college recruiter for DHL Supply Chain, and I support our Southwest and Mid-South regions, which includes Texas and a few surrounding states there. And I actually just celebrated my one year with DHL last week. Um, I am currently sitting out of our headquarters in Columbus, Ohio, where I now call home, um, but I originally grew up in Southern California. Um, I graduated with my undergrad in psychology from Loyola Marymount in Los Angeles and have my master's in higher ed from Texas Tech. So been all over the map there. All right, thank you so much, Michelle. And Susan. Yeah, my pleasure to wrap this up for introductions. Uh, my name is Susan Mason. I am the Assistant Director of Talent and Innovation Programs at UT System. So I'm at the Mothership in Austin. Um, we aren't on a campus. We're in a high-rise building in downtown Austin. And uh, 
this is my sixth year at the system office, but I can't believe I'm going to say this. I've been within the University of Texas system for 20 years this year. I was at UT Austin prior to this. Um, and uh, my background is a little windy. I started in higher ed in international education, working with um, international programming, exchange students, um, study abroad, got recruited into career management to work with international students in their job searches, which was great. That job then expanded. So I was leading that team and had the opportunity to move over to UT system and work with career services um, teams across the 14 institutions within UT system. Um, this is one of my favorite things is that we got to launch an internship the first year that I started. So in uh, 2020, we um, launched the internship right as COVID was starting. So an exciting time to figure out how you want to do that. Um, and the interns that we hire are all um, working within the University of Texas system administration. So we're about 800 strong. We're small, mighty. There you go, David. Told you somebody was showing up in this. <laughs> um, and we have about uh, 42 positions open this summer. Um, and I'm really excited to tell you more about it and to be here with you today. Thanks for inviting me. Fantastic. Thank you so much uh, to our panelists for being here. I just want to point out all of our panelists are MavSedge partners and they all have positions available in Handshake. I just really want to thank you for partnering with us and offering opportunities to UTA students. I know the audience is interested in learning more about your programs, so we'll turn things over to our guests to share more information about their organizations. And we'll start with Amogee Bank. If Ilonia, if you would please go ahead and tell us about your company, your program, and any current needs that you would like to highlight. Absolutely. Thank you so much for the time. I am going to share my screen. Please do let me know if uh, you can see it. Yes. Fabulous. All right. Well, excited to share about Amogee Bank. Um, just a heads up, and some people wonder what is Zions? What is Zions Bank Corporation? It is our parent organization. I am a Zions uh, Bank Corporation employee, but I work specifically with Amogee Bank, which is our Texas affiliate. So for those who are residents of Texas, of course, you all, or most of you at least, um, you are familiar with Amogee Bank as the Texas brand. We do have affiliates, other affiliates across 11 states. We are a regional bank, and we are across the southwestern region of the United States. Now, what we like to say is uh, we're the best small big bank, and that's kind of what makes us unique. We're in the Goldilocks region, if you will. What uh, that means is we, what we aim to do is have the community bank feel. So, you know, provide a lot of resources, connections, uh, really strong customer service to our clients. But we also have the resources of a, the bigger bank, right? So that um, that's how we leverage that is by our uh, partnership with Zions Bank Corporation, being a part of that larger organization. We also have our local culture, local re uh, leadership and decision making by affiliate. Now, we got started back in 1990, just real quick, as Amogee Bank, uh, we got started as Southwest Bank of Texas, uh, built by Walter Johnson, who to this day works at the Amogee Tower, our headquarters location. I run into him frequently. Uh, despite his age, he is eager to continue building our bank. Uh, we got started at Southwest Bank of Texas in 2005. We joined Zions Bank Corporation and got renamed to Amogee Bank. So that is the brand that you've all probably seen around town. We are um, across the 11 states, as I mentioned, about 416 branches total. In Texas, that's about 75 or so branches. Uh, we are about 80 billion in assets across Zions Bank Four. Amogee makes up about 13 billion of that, just to give you an idea of our size. Uh, Zions is a national uh, leader in SBA lending. So we do have a strong focus on small uh, businesses, local businesses, family owned. Uh, we have a lot of great relationships with that, but we have a tremendous portfolio that's quite diverse. We work with all kinds of businesses of different sizes. That's a little bit about us, just to give you an idea of our span. Now, I feel like another important thing to note would be, uh, what is our mission? Uh, what do we focus on? What's our vision values? Um, just wanted to spend a few minutes on that. I think I've already mentioned customer service. That's something we certainly like to focus on. That uh, relationships and our community, those are all central to who we are, who we are as a bank. It's um, really in every decision that we make 
So regardless of the title or location you have in the organization, we all strive to do the very best for our communities, customers, and each other. We are very much big on volunteerism, getting engaged in the community. Our bankers are involved on boards and local uh, not-for-profit organizations. We do all kinds of different things. But at the core, the mission, you know, what do we want to accomplish is to create a culture of caring bankers who support the growth of businesses, families, and communities we serve. Of course, uh, banks are a huge support to local communities, you know, uh, through the capital that we have. And we want to aid the growth of our community um, through being able to lend the money to businesses who need it. And our vision is pretty simple, to be a great bank for Texas. That's how I got started, built by Texans for Texans, and that is certainly our future as well. So that's who we are. Our core values reflect that as well. Just to name a few, take time to listen. We really focus on listening to our customers. What are their goals and how can we help accomplish them? You know, do the right thing. Integrity is huge. Um, trust. We have to build and maintain trust with our clients. We're handling money. That's quite important. So for those of you, you know, finance accounting majors, very important to start with that accountability and integrity early on. Know that everyone counts. That's a huge part of our DNI culture um, is no matter your background, what you do, you count. You bring a unique voice to our organization and it matters. And we want you to be a part of the team. I'm not going to go through all of them, but you get the idea, I think. That's uh, just a little bit about who we are. Now, I do want to spend a few minutes, of course, talking about the summer internship program. It is very closely uh, related. It's put on by our banker uh, development program, which is our full-time training and rotational program we have at the bank. It is a phenomenal opportunity for a new grads and early career professionals to come in and learn all they need to know to become a commercial banker. I know a lot of times they don't get exposure to what that means to, you know, what is commercial banking? Uh, so many people hear about retail banking, right? But have no idea kind of outside of that, what goes on outside the branch. Well, we work with businesses. We uh, help support. We lend to businesses. And our banker development program is for full-time positions. Well, the internship is an opportunity to have a glimpse into commercial banking. What does that mean? What are the career paths? What skills are involved? What could your career path look like if you were to pursue uh, down this road? So our internship program is eight weeks long. It's from mid-June through early August, and it's really designed to uh, provide you know, college students who are currently juniors, will be rising seniors, with an opportunity to gain the knowledge, experience, and exposure to banking industry. So really, students are given... Um, a balance of, you know, hands-on experience where they get to work on projects, uh, tasks, they work to, they get to work with live clients, live deals. You know, we want to give them that meaningful experience, but also um, to really get some training, you know, some development opportunities. We do have scheduled events throughout the program that is really designed to help them grow some skills. Um, during the internship, they are a member of one of our core lending departments. Uh, all locations do it a little bit differently. Uh, we do have our internship positions in our uh, various markets. So we have Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth, Arlington, and San Antonio offices that are all um, at different times recruit for internships. But we, um, depending on the office, interns are either assigned to one group or they are um rotating through different groups. Basically, the combination of the different assignments that they have and the hands-on experience, um, it really getting them energized and knowledgeable about the banking industry. Uh, they are um, going through, I guess I'll go to the next slide. There's uh, different opportunities that we try to get them engaged in. Of course, eight weeks is a limited time. You know, it's hard to, to change the, the course of the bank in eight weeks or to really make a huge, um, you know, uh, impact, but we do try to get our interns involved in some real activities and get some real work done. Well, depending on the time, you know, uh, what we have going on at the bank, we've had our interns involved in some PPP activities, if y'all remember that during COVID, you know, that was a booming uh, part of our um, activities uh, during that summer of uh, 2020 and some 2021. Um, we have uh, site visits that they help out with um, for our clients. They do, they conduct industry research. Um, they help with preparing a prospect list. Of course, we are always wanting to grow the bank and we're always prospecting for new clients. 
scheduling appointments. Sometimes they get a chance to go on visits with clients and see how we establish that relationships. How, you know, how, how do we have that conversation? How do we get to know our clients? It's really also observing the process of spreading financial statements. You know, how, how do we assess financials? How do we underwrite credit packages or deals? It's a lot of uh, networking opportunities. That's a big part of our internship is getting them exposed, not just to knowledge of banking, but the people, the bankers, right? Is getting to talk to them is that kind of learning. A lot of that is networking with executives. Our leadership team is very excited to meet our interns and uh, credit analysts going through the banker development program. They're the future leaders of the bank. We know that. We want to give them the support and appreciation they deserve. Uh, professional development events, we have different training sessions for them from presentation skills to uh, sales to, you know, all kinds of different things like learning styles. We do deal discussions, uh, presentations by interns. We get them to practice. Uh, we talk about Wall Street Journal topics, other things they've learned during the summer and overviews of different areas of the bank. So they have an understanding, even though they work with one team closely, they learn about the other teams at the bank as well. And of course, volunteer opportunities. Volunteerism is a big part of who we are and our culture, giving back to our communities. So we get our interns engaged in at least one or two uh, volunteer activities during the summer. Now that's a little bit about what they do. I'm so sorry, this is switching slides without my consent. <laughs> I'll skip back real quick just to touch on our qualifications um, for the internship. We do um, look for juniors. So if you're in your junior year, this is a great time to apply for our internship because we want you to be basically a rising senior. Finish your junior year coursework by the time the summer rolls around. We do uh, typically focus on finance and accounting students, but basically business majors. That's who we focus on. Uh, 3.0 GPA minimum. And we do ask for six hours of accounting coursework to be completed prior to the start of the internship. Now, um, a couple additional things. It is a full-time job for eight weeks. So we do ask our students to be ready to work a full-time schedule, 40 hours a week um, between, you know, for the eight weeks that you're with us. And since we do have a strong focus on converting interns to full-time opportunities with the Banker Development Program, we do want them to graduate within a year after the internship. So that is another important factor there. I think that summarizes the qualifications. And just to sum it up further, this is a really great opportunity to get exposure to banking. If you think that might be in your future to become a lender, to work closely with local community businesses, to help out um, with building your community via building up our businesses, this may be a phenomenal opportunity for you. If you're analytical, if you have strong interpersonal skills, like talking to people, getting to learn about businesses, this is a phenomenal way to apply those skills and build a career. And I'm really grateful to be able to share this with you all today. Thank you so much. It, it sounds like just a phenomenal program and opportunity for our business students. Um, I'm, I'm excited to uh, now hear from Miranda. Let's um, let you share the screen and we'll find out what Charles Schwab has to offer. Perfect. I'm getting my screen shared here. I want to make sure I select the correct screen. Can you guys see my presentation? We can. Thank you. Perfect. Awesome. So yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Charles Schwab to get us started, and then we'll go into our internship as well. Perfect. So before watching this video, we're going to watch this quick video that I love it because it's actually from our president of the company, now our CEO, Chuck. We're named after him, Charles Schwab, but he goes by Chuck. He's still alive to this day. He did um, found this company in 1975. The story is really great. So I would love to share that story with you all because the story really showcases our culture. When you think of a Fortune 500 company, a lot of the time you can think of a white collar job or stereotypes that go around working for a white collar industry. And Chuck always wanted to change that. He wanted to make sure that he created a place that was your you're a person first and your professional second. And we care more about the person, both internally that works at Schwab and externally who our clients are. And we want to make sure we provide financial literacy to our clients, but we're also not necessarily putting our clients in their in their 
putting ourselves in their shoes because they may do something different than what we may do. We want to understand their story. We want to understand who they are as an individual so we can help advise them, whether it's financial literacy, whether it's professional development, or whether it's just a listening ear to make sure they get to where they need to be within their financial journey. So that's what we were founded off of. And I want to see if we can play this quick video here. And let me know if you guys can't hear it, we'll skip through it, but sometimes it's finicky with the sound. Can you guys hear it? I can't hear it. David, do you want to check the, the settings for the video? There should be a sound setting on Zoom. If not, we'll skip right through it. Nothing. Technology is great when it works, right? <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Well, I'll send I'll send this video out to y'all so you have it. Um, but really, the gist of the video is when we think of the financial industry and we think of investments. Back in the day, really only the 1% had that literacy and had the access to invest, especially when it came to different bonds and stocks and markets. And so what Chuck wanted to do is really create a company where we could learn about mutual funds and we could get the, the middleman, the people who are maybe only have a dollar or two to invest, get them educated and help them understand the market. And with that, we created Charles Schwab. It grew within years and is today the leading um, industry within the financial organization, especially when it comes to mutual funds. So we really pride ourselves off that because I think it has a lot to do with our culture and, and where we came, what we started from. And so that's a little bit about why we started, what our culture is, and now we'll kind of go into what we do as a firm. So we're a big Fortune 500 company. We have over 37,000 employees. We recently just acquired. So when you acquire a company, you do, it's kind of two companies merging. So Charles Schwab did acquire TD Ameritrade, which is, was another financial firm. We acquired 9,000 employees and acquired more than a million clients. And so we have over a billion clients within Charles Schwab. And so they do have their money invested with us and we do help them with financial literacy. So what does that look like from um, a perspective of how we do the business if we have so many employees, right? So let's go on to the next slide here. So we do have branches in every single state. A branch is either where we're going to have a bank because we are a banking firm as well. We're a bank as well as a financial industry. So we have branches in every single state. We have around 10 branches in every single state. And then those dots you do see are where we have our corporate offices, where our corporate functions are going to sit out of. So example, I'm in HR. I sit in a corporate office. So I am in the Westlake office where you see that star there. We have a brand new building that was built right before the pandemic. Um, and so it's new to us. And so we are sitting out of Westlake. If any of you have driven up to Westlake, you've probably driven past our new building. So loving it here. But we also have locations all over the United States. I actually started my career at Schwab in Phoenix. And when I got into this position, they relocated me here out to DFW. So lots of opportunities. Again, you're a person first. If you want to be in another location, location or there's other opportunities, Schwab's going to make that happen for you. We're really big about making sure that your life comes first and we can make sure that we can um, make that work with your job as well. We want you to work to live, not live to work. And so we want to show all the benefits and all the things here that we call it that we're a Schwamly. When you join Schwab, you're a you're a Schwabie, and a lot of people at Schwab may get married or have like Schwapples, Schwabies, Schwamly. So you'll hear that a lot. Um, I got sucked in really quick when I heard about it. I was like, oh, every every company says that. Every company says they're a family. And sometimes I'm like, I don't know if I love that. Setting healthy work boundaries and professional boundaries are great. Ever since I started at Schwab, it's just they care about you and they care about making sure that you find the right fit and I'm, I'm loving it. And everyone that I've worked with here has just had amazing things to say. We call it the Schwab nice. I don't think there's one person I've met at Schwab that we just didn't get along with and have a great relationship. So we want to continue to build that. We want to make sure that we find the right culture fit when we are getting people into our roles within Schwab. So what we want to talk about in regards to Schwab is 
when we think of early talent, what does that look like in regards to definition? So early talent is going to be somebody who is currently in college, maybe looking for an internship or someone who is two to three years outside of college. So Schwab has developed a early talent organization. So that's the organization that I manage. So what I do is I work with students to make sure we find those right early talent roles that would develop you into the right position here at Schwab. So who do we serve? So we're going to talk about who we serve so we can jump into those roles. So when you think of a financial industry, you're going to have individual investors. So you may be an individual investor. You may be someone who has a hundred, maybe thousands of dollars that you're investing into maybe it's Fidelity, maybe it's Schwab, maybe it's Vanguard, maybe it's Robinhood, but you are an individual investor. You are investing your money into the market with some kind of financial firm. So we serve individual investors. You may call in about your investment and ask how it's doing or maybe want to make some trades or just kind of get educated. We serve all our individual investors. So of all the millions of clients that we have, we have people internally who take those calls. They're licensed stockbrokers. So they have their series seven and their 63. They take these calls, they talk to the individuals and they really help cater to what that person needs and advise them. Then you're gonna have your advisors. And so those are the ones who work um, with our independent registered uh, advisors. So they're not gonna work with our individual clients. They're gonna work with people who, let's say you have a basketball player who has a financial advisor. The advisor may call Schwab to say, hey, I wanna advise my client on what stocks to buy. You work with that advisor to advise them on their client. So lots of different ways, lots of different nuances when it comes to the financial industry. And then you have your employers. So we also work with a bunch of different companies to give them 401ks, retirement accounts, um, different things like that. So we can make sure that they're set up for success in the financial literacy aspect of retirement. Our values, I keep saying this, but we really, really talk about our values. Um, integrity comes a really long way. We want to make sure that we're leading through integrity. Our two catchphrases at Schwab are owning your tomorrow and through clients' eyes. And I think that really showcases internally and externally um, through clients' eyes. For my role, my clients are going to be internal, my directors, but as well as my students. And so I want to make sure that my students are getting educated on the best fit for them. If it's not Schwab at the end of the day, that's okay. Because at the end of the day, I care about them first and then the employment second, because I want to make sure we find the right fit and that I'm educating them on the right things. And so that's what's really important to me is being ethical, empathetic, and proactive when we are talking to our clients, our students. Um, constantly wanting to improve, constantly wanting to grow, constantly wanting to change, right? Everything changes every year. Um, and we want to make sure that we are serving our clients, we are educating our clients, and also we're educating the people internally. And we want to give you all an opportunity where you feel valued. And so at Schwab, we have what's called ERGs. I love them. They're employee resource groups. So as you students may have student organizations, those are like grown up student organizations. So we have 14 different ERGs. Um, I'm currently involved in Seoul, which is our Hispanic um, Latino culture, ERG. I'm also part of Next, which is for anybody that has joined the workforce in the past five to 10 years, just to kind of learn professional development school uh, skills. I'm also a part of our WINS program, which is Women in Business. And so lots of different opportunities for you to be connected outside of the role that you go into. Okay, let's talk about those opportunities oops, that you can go into. So we're a bank we're an investment firm. There's so much needed to make that work. HR, marketing, crime risk management, accounting, finance, uh, communications, any major you can really find a fit. I have a lot of communications majors I've hired within the past four years. I was looking at the data earlier this morning. I've hired over a hundred majors that were outside of business, some music majors, um, lots of people who really just care about people and, and find a fit within the financial industry. That's kind of how I, my degree is special education and now I work at a financial firm. So just my advice is find a firm that has a good culture fit for you and where you could see yourself growing as an individual and a professional. And so we're really big at doing that. We definitely are huge on giving back. So if you were to do an internship with us, you are given um, a day where you'll go out with your team and you guys get to choose um, 
a charity or an event that you go to and you volunteer at for the day. Um, if you're a full-time employee, you are given those eight hours a year and you can choose how you want to use those to go volunteer. In regards to the Intern Academy itself, it's very similar um, to our last speaker that you heard. We normally take juniors going into their senior year because we do want to convert our interns to a full-time program uh, or, or a full-time position. So these are some of the intern positions that we have, advisor services, branch network, corporate risk management, finance, HR, internal audit, investor services, marketing, operations, RBS, retirement business services, and technology. So we even have a couple more that we've added on. So we hire anywhere from 400 to 500 interns every summer. In order to be eligible for the internship, you do have to be graduating a year a semester or a year after that summer. So for example, if you're graduating December of 2024 or May 2025, you are eligible for this summer's internship. If you're a sophomore right now, you're eligible for summer 2025. So those applications will become live in the fall for the summer of 2025. So we do hire a little bit beforehand just because we do have a lot of applicants for these roles and we wanna make sure that we are, you know, being conscious of your time and making sure that we're getting those interviews done in a, in a good amount of time so that you have the interview or you have the offer seven or eight months before the summer starts because we want to make sure that you guys are able to get situated or if you need to relocate for the internship, we want to make sure that we give you the time to, to get that all situated and help you out. All majors are welcome. We have so many different majors, again, that apply for, for our roles. A lot of students, you know, you get this imposter syndrome of, oh my gosh, I don't know if I studied the right thing. I don't know what I want to do. How am I expected to choose a, choose a major and then graduate in four years and jump into it? we all feel that way in some way or another. And so that's why our companies are here to kind of give you that little deep breath and say, there's opportunities, right? There's so many things that you can do. Um, the fact that you got through four years and the fact that you did something at a high level, that's not easy to do. That's why we're looking for these students, right? Did you commit to something for four years? We look at that GPA to see what level you did it at. And we know that we're, you're someone we can grow and develop. And there's other opportunities as well. A a lot of our roles sometimes don't require a four-year degree because we're looking for that, that person that can come in and really serve and help our clients. And we want to make sure we're being fair and equal to everybody because some people don't have the opportunity to go to a four-year college as well. And I know a lot of you came in as transfer students with that associate's degree. You're also qualified for these roles. So don't sell yourself short. Definitely come chat with us at Charles Schwab. We're here to chat with you about any opportunities and make sure that you feel welcomed into learning about any of these roles. So that is it for me. I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Miranda. Such great information. Um, love hearing about these strong internship programs. And so Michelle, whenever you're ready, um, we'll turn things over to you. Wonderful. Thank you. So just kind of going through, whoops. Oh, perfect. Um, so DHL as a whole um, covers multiple different aspects. Um, I, of course, am here today representing our supply chain piece, um, which we are not only the global leaders, but also have the largest part of America's supply chain as well within third party logistics. Um, so oftentimes when we speak to students at career fairs, the first thing we ask you is what you know about DHL supply chain. And that often is because you might think of our um, planes our freight forwarding service, you know, the red and yellow boxes. I mean, those absolutely are a part of the DHL group, um, but might not necessarily be a part of DHL supply chain. So looking at who we are specifically, um, being third-party logistics, we run any and all parts of our customers' supply chain. So we can start in that raw materials portion, especially with um, manufacturing, but where our bread and butter really lies is within the inbound all the way through the warehousing and distribution center portion, um, as well as reverse logistics. So when you think about, um, you know, some of our customers will look at on the next slide here, um, but Nike or Lego, for example, they are really great at making shoes, making blocks um, and selling those, but they might not necessarily know how to store them responsibly or safely, how to get them all across the nation or even 
perspective in the globe to where they need to be to be in consumers' hands. And that really is where we succeed. Um, we also offer our value added services. Um, so those are different pieces of if you've ever bought like the Kraft Mac and Cheese two pack at the grocery store, um, those are actually packaged at our warehouse, um, one of which being in the Fort Worth area. Um, and then we also have our returns or reverse logistics, um, which if you have returned something to Walmart or maybe even returned a used phone to Verizon, um, those get shipped to DHL warehouses where we then review if they meet our customers' standards um, and are able to then send them back out as you know refurbished technology or send them back out to your local Walmarts or are able to responsibly dispose of them per our customers' guidelines there. So I touched on a few of our customers here, but we operate across multiple different sectors. Um, and this really just touches on, we often say we are a part of everyday life um, and we really are. You can't get through your day without touching something that DHL has also touched um, or is responsible for getting into your hands. So across our consumer sector, we've got several big names there. Um, you know, if you got Legos for Christmas, oftentimes you'll have some of these. Um, I know mac and cheese really was my big thing when I was a college student. Um, across retail, um, we have multiple different pieces that also go hand in hand with our e-commerce as well. Um, Carhartt being one of our largest and newest sites in the Fort Worth, Roanoke area. We also have automotive engineering and manufacturing. So um, we are responsible for um, about 75% of the tires in America. So chances are three out of four of the tires on your car um, have come through DHL, actually through one of our Texas sites. Um, technology and services, anything that has a computer chip in it most likely has come through us, as well as some of the scanners that actually do those pieces. So if any of you work at grocery stores, um, Target, anything like that where you've got those cool barcode scanners, um, those are actually made at our Zebra site, um, also in the Dallas area. Um, life sciences and healthcare, we are responsible for 70% of the vaccines in the United States. Um, so we made the um, supply chain for the Pfizer COVID vaccine, which was obviously a brand new uh, supply chain for the industry as a whole, um, being that it had not only storage, but also transportation aspects for keeping it at a safe temperature and then also chemical and energy as well. So if there's something that you are interested in, um, we absolutely have opportunities there. Um, we have over 500 sites across North America alone, which for us is Canada and America. Um, the Dallas area being one of our, what we call a campus location. So we have 16 DHL sites within the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, um, but we have multiple other campus areas as well. Um, we have sites in almost every state in the US. Um, they just might not necessarily have a concentrated amount to show up as a red dot here. So for example, if St. Louis is home for you, um, if Arizona or Salt Lake City are, um, we have sites there. It's just under our eight site threshold to be noted as a campus location for us. And our internships, um, we have internship and full-time opportunities, um, and we have a vast majority. The most of what we do, though, is in our operations. So our operations internship um, is 10 to 12 weeks long, starts sometime in the May period. Um, we work with you based off of your availability for what day works as a start date, and then can extend your internship anywhere um, past that 10 week mark if you are looking to have um, an additional paycheck up until you return back onto campus at UTA. Um, and we have um, different program aspects of development, um, but also to you're working on different continuous improvement projects. So we can teach you supply chain. What we're really looking for for this is different leadership aspects. If, are you going to be a self-starter? Are you asking questions? Um, really being what we call our ACE candidate. Um, so, you know, if you're a supply chain or a business major, wonderful. But uh, I, myself, I have never studied supply chain. I remember Googling what supply chain even was the day before my interview. Um, so definitely do your research ahead of time. But we can teach you all that you need to know in terms of the business aspect. What we're really looking for is people who are um, curious learners and um, want to be in a space where they are able to make an impact. That's all. Again, uh, what a fantastic opportunity. And I will 
Um, never look at Legos or mac and cheese the same way again. <laughs> um, thank you for uh, providing that presentation. And Susan, we'll hear from you next. Absolutely, my pleasure. So um, all of you as uh, UT Arlington students are part of UT system already. So I will confess that when I applied for a job at UT system administration, I did not know there were 14 institutions. So you are not alone if you know UT Arlington, maybe UT Austin, UTSA, UT Dallas. There's also MD Anderson is a UT institution. Um, Southwestern, UT Southwestern, obviously a UT institution. There's a, a medical branch in Galveston. We're all over the place. I, I had no idea quite the vast reach again until I came to work for the system administration. Um, and Stephen F. Austin just joined this past year. So um, we now have a new color added to our orange and blue because they have kept their purple. So um, that's been an exciting addition. But it's over 260,000 students in the University of Texas system. We're one of the largest largest employers in the state and one of the largest university systems in the country. So um, when I came on board, uh, I had been working with students my entire career. And then suddenly I was in a 19 story um, high rise in downtown Austin and there were very few students around. And suddenly I could have three hours with no one interrupting me, which anybody who's worked on a campus knows does not happen on a campus. And so it was a big adjustment. Um, I wasn't sure I was going to make it. Ultimately, I did like it uh, and stuck around. Um, but I also missed working with students. So I had the opportunity to convince some folks that, hey, we need to reconnect our staff and their purpose, which is serving students across the University of Texas system, uh, to the students they're serving. Um, we're a little bit separate because we're not on a campus, though our uh, our goals and our our mission is to support students. We just do it a little bit from a distance. So I thought that the internship, uh, having an internship program with the University of Texas System Administration would be the best of both worlds. It would reconnect our staff to the students that we serve and allow students to have a deeper understanding of how higher education works in the state. And another confession, um, when I finally moved into higher education, I had this, what feels like a very foolish epiphany that um, all the people who had helped me in college, that was their career. I didn't look at my career services people or the registrar or the people who helped me study abroad, which was my entry into higher education as, oh, those are careers, those are things I could do for a living. Um, so to get students who think of education as just teaching, yes, that's obviously a huge part, but there's so many other things in every field and function that you can think of. So we started, as I said, during COVID, hot mess, thought we were going to be in person 100% uh, of the time, uh, wound up being 100% remote, but wound up giving us a huge opportunity to really um see that not only could we have a strong internship that was 100% remote, um, but that we could then adapt uh, both ourselves as staff running the program, but also having the grace and good humor was the phrase of the summer uh, with the students in the program who really helped us to grow it and to develop uh, how we wanted to expand. And so ultimately now we're in our fifth year, we started with um, 10 positions, now we have about 42. And to put that in perspective, we, we are small but mighty, and we're only about 850 people in UT system administration. Um, and that's where all of the students will really work. So it's not out at the campuses, which can be something that's a little bit confusing about us. You're not on a campus, you're actually working for administration, and you could be remote. You could be working for the headquarters in Austin um, and be coming in hybrid schedule as we do. Uh, you might have the opportunity to work in Dallas if you're with one of our IT teams and you'd prefer to be there. We have some physicians that would love to have you in person, but if that doesn't work, we know that you can do great work remotely and that we can give you a great program remotely. So there's an option for that. We'll have people in Houston working for University Lands. That's a whole nother bucket. Um, it's basically like having an oil and gas company embedded within our organization. Um, and they're having um, 10 students will be in person in Houston. <clears throat> so ultimately, the biggest pieces you need to know about our program are, are the components. We're a 10 week paid internship. We start and end at the same time. So everybody on boards uh, together and off boards together. Um, and uh, 
you know, as all of these positions that you've been hearing about today are paid, you know, that was a big thing that in higher ed and in some areas in nonprofit, that wasn't always happening. And that was something that as we developed the program, we're like, absolutely, everyone will be paid regardless of the fact that as a higher education entity, we are a nonprofit. Um, we do ask our supervisors to have project-based work. One of the things that you've heard from a, a lot of, of the folks speaking today is that, you know, they want to be able to move you into a full-time position at the end which I love. And as a career services person, I'm like, yes, please keep doing that, all of you. Um, we actually can't guarantee that at the end of our internship. We're a just-in-time employer because we're smaller and we have to have an opening to be able to move somebody into it. Now, we have had interns have that opportunity. It's about timing. Um, and so when that happens, we love that. Um, and we are trying to put you into the pipeline. So even if it's not right away, then you are looking back at us for, uh, to be a potential employer down the road. But with that in mind, we want to make sure that you have a, a great experience that you can take and leverage for the next experience. So going into those interviews. So we ask our supervisors to provide project based work so you have a story to tell from beginning to end in your interviews so that you can talk about the good, the bad, the ugly, the things you messed up, the challenges you had, how you fixed it, how your network was there to support you and how you grew in that opportunity. Um, and those can make for really powerful pieces uh, when you go into your next interviews, which brings us to the professional development component. Um, most of our programs do have that. We have that in common. I love that. We're seeing more and more of that in internship programs, which is fantastic. Um, and part of ours is, again, to help you set you up for success in that next thing, whether it's with us or with someone else. So we will we'll meet as a cohort um, once a week with my team. We'll bring in some guest speakers and we'll have opportunities to have you know coffee chats with the executive officers. There's a Q&A with the chancellor. Um, there are workshops on imposter syndrome, and there'll be one on chat GPT and the job search this year and how to leverage that uh, to make it a little bit easier. So we really enjoy those opportunities and you'll have the opportunity to start building that network with your peers during that time as well. Um, you're also paired with a mentor who's a professional staff member, typically in a department that is not yours so that they can help you understand the organization better and that you have a safe space to go to somebody and say, I was in this meeting and I didn't quite get this thing that was going on. Can you help me understand the, the culture here and have sort of a cultural informant, if you will, to help you decipher some of the things as a new professional in the organization. Um, and then one of the things, having come out of career services and coming into this type of a role that I kept hearing from, um, from our career services team, like your folks here, uh, Julie and David, and uh, was that the time goes so fast for any of these programs, you know, whether it's eight, nine or 10 weeks, man, it flies when you all start these in the summer. And it's difficult to take the time to process as you go. And remember in week two, what was I thinking about? What were the challenges? What was making me nervous? How did I get past it? So we try to build in time for you to do that processing and make those notes. So again, that you have more powerful stories to tell when you get into your next interviews or are approaching another job search. And you can really pull apart the skill sets that you're learning that, that you're improving on. Um, and last, I've mentioned that you'll be in a cohort. We do believe, you know, as students across the University of Texas system, across the state of Texas, that you're coming into um, your professional life with a group of peers. And that those, that's a group that you can start to leverage <clears throat> as a part of the internship itself. We also, as part of professional development, require all of our interns to do at least two informational interviews um, because you're working with an entity that is um, invested in your education and, and your future careers. Um, there's a lot of access and folks in the network who will then help connect you with people in, in the organization and outside of it. You know, a lot of folks worked in industry before they came into higher ed. Um, they have contacts there. So regardless of the function, people are very generous with their network um, when you work within UT system. <clears throat> we keep growing um, as the the as folks are seeing the great work that interns do over the summer. There's there's no busy work. There's no like go do this research and then great, you did a great job researching kind of thing. It's uh, we're we're too lean. So we actually I I joke, but it's absolutely serious that my data analytics interns, I can't run this program without them, quite literally. I do not know R. 
I am not an Excel macros person. So if my data interns that I have right now were to leave tomorrow, I would not be able to process your applications without finding somebody who could do those things. So it is real work on real projects across, as you can see, a really wide variety of areas. These are some of the, the positions that'll be available this year. Um, and I would also say that the interns have had a really huge influence on the organization. I'm really excited. Um, you know, the data analytics interns that I've had for the last, gosh, four years have all been from UT Arlington. They've been phenomenal. Um, we've been able to keep some on for a period of time as full-time employees, which has been great. They've gone on to do things like work for MD Anderson and data analytics there. So still staying within the network of UT system. It's not just system administration, um, but outside of it. And uh one of my interns that we hired last year is still with us. So we hired her from last summer and she stayed on. She's in radio, television, and film. And I thought we need to step up our marketing. We don't have much going on in video. She came in and I had very vague instructions for her and she took stuff and ran with it. It was phenomenal. So now we have all kinds of digital animation things going on. And um, it's really fun to see how that has now influenced other teams to say, oh, we want a video and digital marketing intern. Um, and so now we have multiple positions that so would be really great for radio, television, and film students or anyone interested in that area. So very influential within the organization. And just last, um, application closes on March 1st. That's the biggest thing you need to know. When you go to our application, you can apply to up to three positions through one application. You'll upload one resume and you can um, then customize your cover letters for each position. You won't hear from anyone until March. So if you applied already and are, were early, don't worry. No one started reviewing them yet. Um, the hiring managers will all get them right at the beginning of March. And we're hoping to have all the offer letters out by the beginning of April. So um, with that, I will send it back to you, Julie, for questions. Hey, thank you so much, Susan, and, and all of our panelists. This has been so informative. Um, really great internship programs. Uh, just curious, how many of you actually had internships when you were a college student? Okay, Susan, what what was that like for you or, or Michelle? Um, I love I love to talk about this because I had an internship and decided I did not want to go into that field, and I think that's really important for students to hear. Um, I was dead set on I was going into PR. I was an English major, theater minor. I had a fantastic, it really was a fantastic internship at the Orpheum Theater in Memphis, and um, I hated it. The people were great. The work was fine. I could do it. It was no problem, but it was not what I thought it would be, and it was a wonderful opportunity to figure that out in a semester rather than going wholeheartedly at it full time and getting into a full time job and realizing, oh my gosh, this is not what I thought it was. And that is completely okay. That is what internships are for. It's to try things out. It's to test it. I met some fantastic people who helped me figure out some other things. And um, I, I am really thankful that I did it. Um, and still, you know, for a long time, had relationships with those folks who helped me along the way and helped me kind of ideate on other things that might be a better fit. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It It is supposed to be a learning experience, uh, whether it's something that you want to do for the rest of your life or something you don't want to do, but you're still learning something. You're getting something out of it. Michelle, do you want to share anything about your experience? Yeah, I had um, the privilege to intern at Vans, um, the shoe company, when oh. I was in undergrad, um, and I did an HR internship, and I loved it because it actually gave me the exposure to being a college recruiter. I didn't know that it was a role that previously existed, and although it wasn't what my internship specifically was in, um, it introduced me to a whole bunch of corporate roles that I wouldn't have otherwise known existed had I not been um, introduced to um, the space, um, even though obviously I'm in a different industry now, I got to really learn all of the different career paths that are out there because there are so many more than you can even imagine. Um, and, you know, it was just a really great time. And I'm still actually close with several of my friends who um, I interned with that was in my cohort that year. That's great. I love hearing about other people's internship experiences. Um, if a student is working at your organization, I know they always, I always get this question a lot. How can they stand out if they do want to um, get hired at 
you know, after the summer, what, what can they do to make an impact? I can jump in on this one. Um, I think really individualization. So understanding, you know, your skill sets and also maybe areas of opportunity for you. And once you have that understanding, networking, right, getting in front of the right people and getting comfortable doing that. Some of us, we all have different personalities. We all have different soft skills and technical skill strengths. And so kind of understanding what that looks like for you and maybe asking for a mentor networking. I had an intern um, that I was working with last year in an operational world, a little bit quieter, more of an analytical thinker where I'm a little bit louder and more of an emotionally driven thinker. And so it was great to work with her. And even though she may not think the same way or act the same way as me, it was a great opportunity for us to have a mentor with each other. So she really cared. She's like, Miranda, I'm really shy and I'm not quite sure, but this is the role I want to get into. What can I do? So just being vulnerable is a big thing too. Whether you're a little bit more quiet or a little bit more loud, having those conversations, putting yourself out there, people respect that. They want to see you want to grow. They want to see you put in the effort um, to do that. And we want to teach you, if you don't know where to start, start somewhere. And if the company is the right fit for you, they'll help you get to the right place. They're going to give you those conversations and make sure that we um, get you where you want to be and where you want to go. I had no idea where I wanted to be when I was an intern. And thank goodness I had so many leaders. I've had eight different roles here at Schwab um, and I've had six different leaders and all those leaders are still here and I'm still here. We just grow and change constantly. Our corporation is really about um, internal growth and making sure we can cross train and that you all have the opportunity to do that. So what I would, what I would say is network, learn about other positions, put yourself out of your comfort zone, try to be vulnerable in whatever comfort and boundary that looks like for you. That is great advice. Thank you so much. Does anyone have anything to add to that, Alonia? Yeah, I'll chime in. Miranda, phenomenal advice. I was definitely going to, you know, recommend networking. That is a fantastic way to not only explore career opportunities, but, you know, as far as which direction you want to pursue, if you don't know yet, right? But also actually finding opportunities, connecting with people is one of the best ways to land an opportunity. You know, when recruiters get hundreds of applications, it, it can be hard to stand out, right? Managers are overwhelmed. When you have a personal connection, when you have someone who can vouch for you, that goes such a long way to helping you land that opportunity. But another advice, right, in addition to that, uh, I'll be boring. I'll give the standard recruiter advice your resume. Sadly, years, hundreds of years later, we haven't come up with a better way to, you know, advertise yourself yet. Of course, there are other ways to do it. But when you apply that one piece of paper, you know, that one pager is often your way to an opportunity, at least the first step. You have to make sure that your resume is the best in the best shape it can be. You know, make sure it looks uh, right. It's formatted correctly. It looks presentable. It is a representation of you. So think about it. If you have any, even as simple as a misspelling can say, oh, you know, maybe they don't have attention to detail. Be very careful what you put out there. Make sure it works for you, not against you. And just remember, you know, it's extra work, but when applying across different opportunities, different positions, you may want to tweak your resume, you know, not just the same old general resume for different opportunities. You want to make sure to get connected, to get invited to a next interview, how can you make yourself stand out as a candidate on that resume? How do your skills and experiences align with what they're looking for? What makes you a well-rounded candidate? And what can you possibly highlight that will make you stand out? Because as you know, hiring managers look through lots and lots of resumes, they want something to jump out at them and say, hey, I wanna meet that candidate. They look interesting, they look, they look solid. Let's go ahead to the next steps. So definitely encourage you to work on your uh, resume in addition to networking. Thank you. That is fantastic advice. Um, networking keeps popping up too as a theme. What is the best way for students to network um, even before they start applying for jobs? Uh, should they reach out on LinkedIn? What do you recommend? I'll, I'll jump in. Um, okay, I think First, in order to network, kind of get an understanding of, of where you're wanting to network, because every company is a little bit different on the platforms that they'll use. Maybe they're very LinkedIn heavy. Maybe it's Handshake, right? We know the UTA students are Handshake users. So kind of get an understanding of, of the company and where they 
where they may post, but also just kind of doing research on what you're interested in and names will pop up, institutions will pop up. So starting to kind of research, LinkedIn is a great place to start. That's where I kind of started, um, but there's lots of other resources as well that other companies use, but I would always start with LinkedIn. And again, I'll say this again, but put yourself in a vulnerable position. If you see a company that really stands out and you maybe see a name associated with that, it might be not the right person in the right department, but they can get you there. Just introduce yourself and say, hey, I'm a junior currently and I love what your company stands for and I was really interested. Could I set up a one-on-one -on -one or could I get an email connection to get connected with your company or somebody I can chat with just to learn a little bit more? That's such a great way to first practice being vulnerable, practice writing a, a professional note, because you're going to be doing that within your career, right? So I think that's a great way first is use LinkedIn, be vulnerable, reach out, do your research. Great. Thank you for that. Does anyone want to add anything, Michelle? Yeah, I was just going to add, utilize your clubs on campus. Um, when we are coming on campus, when we are looking to connect with students who might be interested in our industry, we're reaching out to those clubs. And I know um, that they are not necessarily uh, subjective. So for us, a lot of logistics clubs, um, you don't have to be a supply chain or even a business major. I oftentimes talk to people who are like, I'm interested in it, but I just don't want to commit to a course. And that's totally fine. You have that network um, of not only careers that are reaching out, um, but even more so for peers, different people who are learning, experiencing different internships, um, have different networks within the industry for you to be able to leverage. So always want to plug um, those peer connections just as much as you have those um, professional as well. Absolutely. Susan? Yeah, I'm just going to add, you know, I know a lot of people feel a little squeamish about the idea of networking, right? It feels... Hmm, inauthentic it feels slimy <laughs> it feels you know and and I think there's a bit of reframing that has to happen because it doesn't have to be a heavy ask you know you're not going to walk into your first networking thing and go hi I need a job can you help me so back it up to you know about learning and exploration and and I would say if you're really anxious about it start with the things that are low risk start with people that are low risk and then build up right your family, they have jobs, your aunts, your uncles, you know, your parents, your parents, friends that you've grown up with, your friends, parents, they have careers. We don't see them in that way because they're our family or they're our friends, parents, right? But they all have jobs and they will have connections and they know you. And so if you are sincere and trying to educate yourself about a field or a function, they're going to be more than happy to help you. And then they're going to give you new ideas and maybe have new people to connect you to. So if it's something that makes you really nervous, start with people who are comfortable just in exploring particular roles. I've never heard of half the things my family had done, you know, until I was well out of college. And then it's all the pieces started to fall together. Oh, I get what that is. And I didn't know what a perfusionist is. That's what my uncle does. Like, you know, and so you don't even know half the things that there are out there that you could do. So just recognizing that the, the adults out in the workforce that you interact with every day have something to contribute to this conversation and are very happy to help you figure it out. They want you to succeed. So if you said, hey, could we just talk about your job and what you do and other jobs that touch your job? I'm just trying to figure out what all my options are. They're going to be happy to help. So go low risk first, and then you'll build confidence also and more direction in who you want to approach next. You might feel a little more nerve wracking. Very Great advice today. Um, I couldn't have said any of this better myself. I um, Unfortunately, we are out of time. I would love to keep this conversation going, but students, I hope that you will definitely reach out to our panelists. Um, remember that their information is in the chat. Uh, start your networking today. <laughs> um, and that will conclude our panel. Um, I just want to ask if there's anything else that um, our panelists would like to add or that we didn't mention. Um, I want to give you an opportunity to do that before we close. 
I'll take a just a quick one. Sure. <laughs> just want to share some, uh, you know, words of advice for the students and encouragement. Um, you know, if you don't hear back from a networking attempt, don't get discouraged. You know, you you got to try different things, different routes. Don't think just because, you know, some person had a, a hard day, busy schedule, they didn't respond to you. Don't get discouraged. Keep trying, you know, different, connect with different people. And I definitely encourage you, you know, to, to gain experiences, you know, even if they're different ones. Some students come to me and say, hey, I didn't put that on my resume because I didn't think it was relevant. Hey, guess what? Makes you a love rounded person. You got an experience. There are a lot of transferable skills that you gain through the different exposure and experiences you have in your lifetime, whether working, volunteering, student organizations, you know, put it on there, uh, bring it up through your interviews. You know, it's every little bit makes you you and gives you unique perspective and companies crave that, you know, they, they want different voices, different people with unique skill sets. So, you know, whatever it is, whether it's an internship, whether it's a job, you know, whether it's a, you taking a leadership role on campus at a student organization, it all brings value and makes you a standout candidate. So whatever works for you, you know, um, just leverage your strengths. Thank you so much for that. And I think we will close on that note. So um, again, panelists, thank you so much for being here this afternoon and your wealth of advice that you've given our students. Students, I wish you good luck for the rest of the semester. Take care, everyone.